Okay, good afternoon, everyone. It's a little after one o'clock Eastern, so we'll get started. Now, my name is Jerry Hahn from Purdue University Sirius. I'd like to welcome you to the July 24th session of the Sirius Summer Security Seminar Series. We're very pleased with the lineup we have in place, and we hope that you will benefit from hearing from the cybersecurity experts and practitioners we've assembled at these weekly seminars. These sessions would not be possible without the support of the members of the Sirius Strategic Partnership Program. To learn more about Sirius and the Sirius Strategic Partnership Program and how your organization may benefit, please contact info at sirius.purdue.edu. During the presentation, please keep your line muted. If you have a question, please submit your questions via chat to all panelists, if you could, or use the Q&A function. We'll also be monitoring the raise your hand function on the WebEx. It's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today. Dr. Nandi Leslie is an engineering fellow at Raytheon Technologies, serving as an applied mathematician and principal investigator at the U.S. Combat Capabilities Development Command Army Research Lab. She supports the Raytheon Intelligence and Space Business Area and ARL on research and development projects related to machine learning and cyber and electromagnetic activities. Dr. Leslie has published over 40 papers in journals, conference proceedings, magazines, and government technical reports on machine learning, cybersecurity, network resilience, submarine security, and mathematical biology with over 375 citations. She has, been, she has given over 30 research talks at national and international conferences in both classified and unclassified settings. Dr. Leslie received her undergraduate degree in mathematics from Howard University, her master's and PhD in applied and computational math from Princeton. Before joining Raytheon, she spent two years as a lecturer and postdoc researcher at the University of Maryland College Park in the Department of Mathematics. She was also a program manager and senior operations research analyst for Systems Planning and Analysis, Inc., where she developed modeling approaches for the U.S. Navy Submarine Security Program, the Office of the Security of the Office of the Secretary of Defense, and the Joint Program Offices focusing on various tactical problems in different domains such as submarine, research, submarine search and detection in oceanographic and atmospheric environmental conditions for the Navy, and damage assessments and remediation of cyber attacks to the defense industrial base. Wow, I'm tired just reading that. That's, that's a great background, <laughs> and we really appreciate you joining us, Dr. Leslie. So with that, I'll just turn it over to you. Yes, thank you, Jerry. Thank you so much for um, inviting me and uh, having me here in this serious seminar series. Um, it's a pleasure. Uh, today, I would like to talk with you about um, using computational modeling and um, algorithms for network security. And this is research that I've done in collaboration with a number of partners um, of both Raytheon and the Army Research Laboratory. I um, also would like to mention that um, as a, a contractor at the Army Research Laboratory, I've become familiar with the um, kind of extended site structure of ARL, and um, Purdue University is a part of the ARL Central. There are a number of enclaves of um, the lab across the country and across the world. And ARL Central is located in um, Chicago, led up by Mark Chop, and um, it sees uh, uh, Purdue as an integral partner. So this, um, um, you know, any collaboration that could come out of this effort would uh, definitely be welcome to, you know, discussion um, to formulate better. Uh, so, you know, today um, I'm going to first go over a wide swath of research that um, I've been doing with partners and co-authors over the last, um, well, since FY18, and then um, kind of converge on the work in network intrusion detection specifically and the use of machine learning um, for that purpose. Uh, if there are any questions throughout, I certainly do welcome them. Uh, please feel free to interject um, throughout the talk. There's no, no need to wait until the end and forget what you wanted to say. <laughs> In any case, um, 
Yes. So the uh, first, just an overview of the program at the Army Research Laboratory that I'm a um, principal investigator for. Uh, this program is called the Proactive Adversarial Modeling Project. And um, it is supporting one of ARL's essential research programs. It's the essential research program or the um, umbrella program for this project is entitled uh, Foundational Research for EW or Electronic Warfare and Multi-Domain Operations, and we call it FREEDOM. And um, this essential research program has a number of projects. One um, is looking at cyber deception as a defensive mechanism. So what can the defenders do um, to uh, either mimic um, you know, real traffic or um, camouflage operations or obfuscate network traffic in order to present a more defensive, resilient, robust network um, for, um, you know, for a tactical scenario. And um, so that's the Freedom ERP. And, and there are a number of projects within it. Specifically, this is one that's related to cyber and electromagnetic activities and um, emulation or cyber deception. And, and traditionally in um, cyber security or network security, as some like to say, this has been um, implemented via the HoneyNet or HoneyPot. And, um, you know, that's what since the 80s that, that has started to be a mechanism for um, the defense of a network. And um, yeah, going hand in hand with that is, uh, can we, in order to make it an adaptive um, network that has the so-called honey net structure, um, can we learn predictively, can, you know, can we forecast the um, preferences of the uh, attacker, well, in terms of network activities. Can we, um, say, predict the timing and frequency of attack and type? All right. And so the goal of this project um, is to improve and, and complement attack detection. Um, it's also to enhance prevention. It's also to um, mitigate successful attacks. And, and we've been working on this since I think I said uh, FY18, and it's projected to be um, a project into FY25 where there's a planned capstone um, demonstration across uh, the directorates of um, Sensor and Electronic Directorate and the Computational Information Sciences Directorate at ARL. Uh, there are stakeholders, of course, in the Freedom ERP, as I mentioned, but also in the, um, uh, the Collaborative Research Alliance, or CRA. Uh, this is a multi-year, in fact, um, for the Cybersecurity CRA, there are two. Uh, the Cybersecurity CRA is in its seventh year, I believe, seventh or eighth year of 10 years where this is between an agreement between ARL and Penn State and a number of other partner um, institutions that are in the consortium, including Carnegie Mellon. And then there's also the Internet of Battlefield CRA. Um, and then these two CRAs um, definitely provide a collaboration um, you know, for this project, and um, also just insights theoretically that we can leverage uh, for the internal project that this is to ARL. Uh, there are also transition partners that we've been working integrally with for this um, this project, including a sort of sister organization within uh, the combat capabilities development. Um, uh, center, CCDC, where ARL now falls, and that's the C5ISR Center. And then also DARPA has a program um, using 
uh, game theoretic approaches for um, um, command um, uh, and sort of, sort of decision making. And um, so they're another technology or a technical transition partner for this particular project. We're looking to be able to close the gaps um, here in, in the research um, with this project. So in, in general, on the research um, to date in this area of network security has been more reactive than it has been proactive. And so we're trying to move toward being proactively postured in a way in advance of the, um, in advance of an attack or an advanced persistent threat um, be able to have a security posture that um, is robust to attack so that a mission um, success of the network is, you know, is still feasible. Um, and this is critical in um, the tactical setting. It's also critical in, um, you know, just civil settings as well. Um, one wants to know that regardless of whether there is an ongoing attack, that certain aspects of the network can remain functioning. Um, you know, and so these are some of the um, limitations in that we've been reactive, responding and remediating post-attack. We want to have a posture that's more proactively focused towards security. Um, and some of the research questions are, you know, just around can one even develop these kinds of, act, or in an accurate way, these kinds of predictive network security and resilience models? Um, and, you know, if so, what are the constraints? And, and we've begun looking at that. Uh, we've begun looking at that through using machine learning models um, and a, a variety of them. Uh, we've, for example, looked at neural machine translation models to generate fake network traffic. We've also been able to, um, you know, use the uh, sort of community learning via graph theory and machine learning combined in order to first say that an adversary can learn the network topology of um, an, a hybrid network of a um, multitude of devices and device types and, um, you know, protocols used, um, is it is feasible for an adversary to learn the network topology um, if given some amount of information, and if so, um, can one add in deceptive information, decoys, et cetera, into the network in order to um, thwart the adversary's learning capability with these graph learning techniques? So that's just some of the um, progress we've made to date. So, you know, I'll go over some um, related work in this talk, you know, covering some of the outcomes of the project and other projects that I'm supporting at Arrow and Raytheon, and um, get more specific into the semi-supervised learning for exploits and exploit kits, bleak um, algorithm, the approach and metrics used to assess prediction performance, and then um, draw some conclusions. Okay, so I mentioned for the project, um, you know, we're looking at not just uh, intrusion detection, but also deception. Here is some related work looking at what are the dimensions of cyber deception. So, you know, the goal of the cyber deception, or some of the goals are, of course, as I stated, to enhance prevention, um, improve and complement intrusion detection. Um, and, and so, you know, that's in, in part why um, the intrusion detection is kind of really tightly connected with this, 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 this um, notion of deception as a defense. Uh, the layers of deception, of course, can be across the OSI um, network um, um, layers here, and um, you know, one one has a, a, a number of ways that we can deploy this. 
uh, deception, you know, as far as location of the decoys as well as how are they configured? Okay, so um, this is one piece of related work that uh, we were looking at. Is it possible to um, deceive an adversary into believing that some fake users are real users? Uh, this is work done in collaboration with um, ARL and um, Perspective Labs. And uh, what we did is we, using um, this type of deep learning technique, it's called a long short-term memory recurrent neural net and um, another model, a transformer model. We, we looked at can we generate email content that is indistinguishable from uh, um, real human um, content. So is this automatically generated content distinguishable from real content? We found that uh, in fact, yes, we can develop models using this um, neural net technique to mimic traffic. And so this is a component of deception and really to have some, uh, a, a honey net that's believable to an advanced adversary. You know, there has to be not only realistic kind of traffic patterns, but also if the adversary delves a little further into the packet payload, um, we want to have a believable content there as well. Uh, just along the same lines, um, some accomplishments with the cybersecurity CRA um, uh, learning for deception. We've also been able to show that an, uh, an adversary, uh, we can learn the adversary's course of action and um, adaptively automate to um, you know, our deployment of deceptive strategies in order to, um, uh, you know, influence the behavior of adversaries. Uh, and I'm going to just go through some of this relate, because this is all related work. I'm going to go kind of quickly and then um, slow down as we get really into the technical approach for um, network intrusion detection specifically. Uh, so here is um, you know, some additional work where we, again, are looking at can we um, develop a deception schema that mitigates the defender's loss by misleading the attacker to making suboptimal decisions. So basically, this is using a game theoretic approach. We introduced the so-called feature deception game uh, where we both simultaneously use um, a, a machine learning technique in order to learn the adversary's preferences in a network based on their actions. And then a game theoretic approach to determine what the optimal deception strategy is. And we, we show here in um, these graphs that, uh, you know, it is, Possible though this is um, an MP hard problem, it's possible to approximate the algorithm and find some um, optimal decision, uh, deception strategies. So this is some work with um, also through the cyber CRA uh, with my co-authors at Carnegie Mellon University, primarily in ARL. Okay, so this is um, an additional piece of related work. At ARL right now, we're really focused on the um, autonomous vehicle um, and its network. So both the in-vehicle network and the vehicle to everything. Um, so for the in-vehicle network, uh, we're looking at um, you know, both uh, the reactive approaches, but some proactive approaches such as moving target descent. And can we, um, first of all, evaluate what the uh, state of the art is for vehicular communications in vehicle, like for the CAN bus network, right, as well as um, vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to pedestrian, vehicle to the roadside unit. 
And with the V to, this is so-called V to X. V to X security is um, also, you know, an area that we're uh, exploring. Um, so the both, how can we be agile by using um, IP shuffling as a moving target defense operation? And we propose the deep reinforcement learning methodology for network slicing. Um, and this is both to um, look at the resource allocation piece. You know, we want to make sure that the quality of service requirements are met. This is um, also to uh, examine, you know, a proactive defense mechanism and via the moving target defense, and you know to see whether we can accomplish security via this um, shuffling mechanism, as well as resilience by minimizing the resource utilization um, or bandwidth. And here for V to X um, security, we recently submitted uh, a survey with um, co-authors from Virginia Tech and ARL and Mississippi State University. Um, this was with a student who spent um, some time with me and um, other another colleague at uh, ARL from Virginia Tech was the lead here. But you know, this is also work to look at. Well, can we use um, what network intrusion detection anomaly-based methods? are useful for vehicle networks. And this is looking at both the uh, paradigm for the cellular V to X and the vehicular ad hoc network. Um, and, you know, where, you know, either one is using like the 5G or um, communication or uh, IEEE standard, right? Um, 802.11p is generally what, what's being considered. Just going to skip a little bit further into um, some of the challenges for network intrusion detection specifically. Now, um, intrusion detection is a critical piece of network security. Uh, we've been talking a bit about, you know, the proactive um, piece, and, and they, they, they go hand in hand. So the proactive adversarial modeling, can we understand the adversary's approaches? That's kind of been the work um, that I've described up until now. Here we're looking at some of the um, uh, challenges and how to mitigate those challenges for network intrusion detection specifically. So generally, the anomaly-based um, uh, IDS tend to have high false positive rates. That is, they, um, you know, are are, are likely to. Uh, present an alert to a human analyst or to the system as an algorithm. It's presenting this alert that this packet or this packet flow is likely malicious when in fact it's benign and that's a uh, false positive. And um, anomaly-based uh, intrusion detection systems tend to be based on um, computational algorithms and models like machine learning techniques, and um, they often have these high false positive alerts. Now, this can result in um, personnel disregarding the tools entirely, and it also can result in unreported um, network breaches if, in fact, the alerts are being ignored because um, there is this intuition that they may have high false positive alerts. The, challenge are, uh, the, the challenges with signature-based, the other class of network intrusion detection systems or um, IDS, is um, that they tend to misclassify cyber attacks um, as benign. 
And so this is the false negative, right? And they have high false negative rates. And so what um, I was attempting to do, um, you know, with my team here and the folks that I support um, is how do we uh, address these challenges um, for an, a more autonomous setting? And a setting as well where their computational resource utilization constraints are really um, demanding. We can't have a, a, a really um, resource intensive algorithm running in the background. And to date, many of the um, IDS have been signature based, even though there's a whole class of research on looking at the um, you know, use of machine learning and other computational and probabilistic methods for um, anomaly detection. So, you know, I've, I've looked, um, uh, actually, let me just go over this data set that um, I've looked at here. This data set is uh, the Czech Tech University um, out of uh, Czech Republic in Prague. Um, they have this data set called CTU 13. Essentially, it's 13 different scenarios of botnet attacks. And they each have different characteristics. Um, and uh, others have looked at this data set. I, I'm, I'm not the first. And uh, in particular, Sebastian Garcia at CTU is the developer of this data set. And um, he's done some prediction uh, or intrusion detection models using the NetFlow data. And um, you know, I've seen some, some pretty good performance uh, for his anomaly detection methods. I just have here some of his, uh, his methods, performance. Okay, and um, I've also looked at this data set in the past with some colleagues from ARL. Um, we developed a semi-supervised um, semi-supervised learning um, network intrusion detection system algorithm for three scenarios back in 2018. Presented that work at a NATO workshop, um, also in Prague, and um, we looked at the distributed denial of service. Uh, types of botnet, and um, we use k-means clustering algorithms for these three scenarios. And um, each of the scenarios are using the IRC protocol to perform the DDoS attack. Uh, and then we saw um, in, in looking at this clustering, this unsupervised learning clustering um, algorithm, uh, with these three scenarios from CTU 13 that we could get pretty, um, we got accurate results, quite accurate results. Uh, one of them had a low recall and since have discovered an issue with that data. Um, and so it's to, uh, but it's actually the pre-processing of the data as to why that um, recall was so low for one of them. However, you know, this was this work and the other two of the three scenarios um, had excellent results when considering that this is an unsupervised approach. Okay. And this is to distinguish it from supervised learning where you have labels. Uh, essentially here we ignored the labels and used the clustering method. Uh, just to go a little bit over the data set itself, um, one can use the labels to acquire the prediction performance results, right? And the labels are, you know, either botnet of one particular scenario type, right? So there's 13. If you just take one of the scenarios, say um, CTU uh, 1, that scenario, of using IRC protocol to send spam and um, perform click fraud. 
and then it'll have labels as to whether that um, network flow is normal background or botnet flow. Um, so that's the characteristics of the of the data. And the the data really is like packet header information. It's just packet sessions or network sessions data um, in a NetFlow Cisco NetFlow file format. And um, you know the information is both categorical, that is qualitative in nature. You know, um, to say the protocol, for example, ICMP or TCP, as well as numerical. And that's you know, for example, total bytes of, or packet size, number of packets sent, um, duration. These things are numerical. For the categorical data, of course, for the machine learning algorithm, that must be converted. To numerical, and there are a number of text encodings, um, especially a specialized text encoding that's be used for the IP address. IP address, excuse me, uh, which is categorical. And um, basically, I wanted to also be able to visualize Fleek. Um, so for this network intrusion um, implementation, one can, as the model is detecting uh, attack traffic, botnet traffic, the sites are, the nodes are red, and um, for the benign traffic, the nodes are blue uh, for those IP addresses. And um, I looked at a number of clustering and classification algorithms. Um, both the k-means from the previous work and also Gaussian mixture model uh, for the clustering and then k-nearest neighbors for um, classification. And um, you know, of course used cross-validation in this instance the results you'll see are from a k-fold cross-validation method and um, uh, for the k-means um, and other clustering methods, the centroids were placed in, and so this is a semi-supervised step, the centroids were placed around um, the uh, centroid of the malicious and benign data, and this is where the data is used, the labels are used. So in this instance, this is semi-supervised. For the initialization of the centroid, that's the only point where one is looking at this um, uh, metric across the training data. And then for the remainder of the algorithm run, it is completely un um, unsupervised during training. Okay. And some detail about the text encoding. Okay, so for um, protocols, right, for that, specific feature vector, the text encoding we used was one hot encoding. But for the IP addresses, the, um, the metric used is to look at the 32-bit, um, this is for IPv4 specifically, look at each byte and then define a distance across um, IP addresses, and it's defined here. Okay. So this is a slight nuance. Um, and then this is just an example of one of the scenarios, um, a snapshot in time, and of the clustering. Uh, so again, blue are the IP addresses that are benign, and then you see clustered are the uh, red uh, clusters of botnet traffic. Uh, this is using, um, this is where the botnet is using peer-to-peer -peer protocol for a synchronization attack. Um, I have three bots in the network. There was a video, but I, I think I loaded the PDF, so no, without loss of, uh, of anything, without playing that. Okay, so but essentially the video was just to show how um, this detection is done over time, um, seeing, you know, de determining uh, that a given um, 
node is malicious or benign, um, and then just running it over time. Anyway, one can look at um, also the graph degree histogram and um, try and understand uh, what the network topology, sort of the, the connections um, uh, or the number of connections each site has during this um, botnet scenario. So again, it's for uh, scenario 12. Uh, so for sleep, we um, looked at a number of different algorithms and uh, again, um, both the clustering, k-means, and g, um, and then for the Gaussian mixture model as well as the KNN. Um, we have looked at other approaches as well, but just here presenting the results for those. Uh, I'm just going to go over the um, case one where the IP addresses um, are excluded. And so here, um, these are for all 13 of the scenarios. And um, again, you see the prediction performance as far as accuracy, um, precision, which is sometimes called true positive um, accuracy. And then there's recall, which is, an, is synonymous, exactly the same as true positive rate, as well as false positive rate, or FPR. Uh, sleep performs exceptionally well against the, most of the scenarios, um, and uh, also uh, better than the um, previous work on these same 13 scenarios. Here um, we're looking at the uh, a number of algorithms for some of the. Uh, some of the scenarios. So the top table is um, this scenario two, where um, the protocol used is IRC, and it's used to perform um, click fraud and also some spam. Um, also, the results here are precision and recall and false positive rate. It's um, not. I'm not presenting the accuracy here because. There's such a low prevalence of botnet traffic to benign traffic that sometimes accuracy can seem a lot better um, because the numbers are so high in those instances. Really what you want to look at is metrics like these to um, evaluate performance. And the instance with low prevalence or skewed data, low prevalence of malicious data or skewed data somehow. Um, uh, here are some additional scenarios. These are two additional scenarios for the three machine learning algorithms and the performance of them. Again, quite well um, for Canon. Um, it's detecting virtually uh, almost all of the botnet traffic. And um, you know, for the clustering methods, it's not so much, not so good for the Gaussian mixture model as the K-means and Canon. Uh, here, you know, we were able to, with this approach, be able to um, develop a distance metric for IPv4. Uh, we were able to implement both um, semi-supervised and um, supervised learning techniques, um, including clustering. Uh, algorithms in order to uh, evaluate and detect botnet traffic. We saw a really good performance for some of the algorithms, in particular the KNN had the best prediction performance. Um, though in some instances one may need to use the K-means, which although it had um, worse performance, if no labels really exist, or only sparse labeling of the traffic or the specific type of attack exists, then these are the types of algorithms, these unsupervised or semi-supervised algorithms are needed for, for basically um, you know, these types of circumstances where the adversary is deploying zero-day attacks or new um, attacks. 
and conclusion. Uh, we're looking, and we actually recently um, published some work. I, I didn't talk about it in these slides, but we recently published some work and looking at um, using adversarial machine learning um, in order to, one, make our intrusion detection systems more robust, and doing so by first saying what types of automated or autonomous, rather, um, attacks could be generated on the intrusion detection system itself, either in the training or on the um, you know, functionality of the algorithm or post-training and testing. Um, and so if the intrusion detection system is machine learning based, is it vulnerable to attack? And we found yes. Um, and also we're looking at how to mitigate that uh, vulnerability. Um, in addition, we're looking at um, you know, how to um, uh, integrate uh, additional algorithms into Sleek. And uh, what we've shown so far is that it is progress being made, however. Um, uh, we've made some progress on, along the lines of enhancing network intrusion detection um, and the use of, of semi-supervised learning algorithms to do so with nuanced um, uh, text encoding methods and algorithms and um, metrics for uh, IP addresses, essentially, and other types of feature vectors that are specific to um, network traffic. Uh, so the way ahead um, for the proactive adversarial modeling task uh, that I mentioned in just kind of broad terms is to um, continue to integrate the um, RF and cyber deception techniques where the goal is to enhance um, proactive um, mechanisms for resilience network resilience. Um, also this fiscal year, we have been working um, and have, have some uh, accomplishments toward this end of developing computational algorithms for HoneyNet allocation and um, are, are working for, um, working to also look at HoneyNet configuration, adaptive HoneyNet configuration. Uh, we are also working this fiscal year um, and uh, have made some headway in implementing machine learning algorithms for predicting or forecasting adversaries' preferences. And this, this of course, will continue on uh, into 25. Uh, we are also in the near term, we're planning to develop and implement more adaptive um, HoneyNet configurations and developing algorithms for this based on what we learn uh, about the adversary's course of action and when they're in a HoneyNet and what we're detecting with our IDS. So adapt um, the HoneyNet based on what we're learning from IDS and from HoneyNet structure um, and deployment, rather. Also, we're looking to develop and implement um, software-defined networking approaches for cyber deception, as well as just security in general, um, and looking at sort of uh, well, mobile networks that are not quite peer-to-peer, -peer, that hasn't been done yet, but, but looking at SDN um, for some sorts of uh, hierarchical network structures um, that are not completely traditional. And um, so that's work that's actually starting, um, but we, uh, we're starting a little early, but the plan is for us to actually have results in FY22 and 23. Um, 
Yeah, so this is uh, basically um, some of the work that we have been able to uh, complete. This is the final slide here. Um, this fiscal year so far uh, as a team. And, um, you know, this is, includes a number of demos um, where this work on intrusion detection using machine learning and um, cyber deception modeling have been um, presented uh, using a number of tools. Um, including Python and this network emulation tool, CyberVan, um, developed by uh, one of our partners at Perspective Labs, and then an NRL tool called SDT3D uh, for display. We've also been able to develop um, partially observable stochastic games for cyber deception in addition to the machine learning approaches. Um, and uh, we've, um, the team has um, published a number of books where um, I've contributed a few chapters um, as a co-author. And um, also we've given so many presentations throughout the fiscal year and uh, you know, just trying to engage with you, know, you the um, science and technology research and development communities um, across not only academia, but also the government um, agencies and, and industry. With that, I'll um, just ask if there are any questions. I'd be happy to address uh, any. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Alessia. That was very good. I, I don't see any questions at this point in time. So if there, there are questions out there, uh, please uh, put up a chat or a Q&A, and we have a few minutes where we can, we can address those. In the meantime, I, I would like to very much express my appreciation to, to Dr. Leslie for uh, presenting today. And also my appreciation to our friends at Raytheon, who are uh, obviously one of our, our key strategic partners at Sirius. And I noticed uh, a few of the Raytheon folks I recognized on, on the call today, so I appreciate you taking the time as well to, uh, to join the conference. I'll also mention that all these sessions uh, for the summer are being recorded, and you'll soon be able to view them at our Sirius website for the Sirius YouTube channel. Uh, so I do want to thank everyone for taking time today and, uh, and listening in on the talk. Uh, next week on July 1st, uh, we have a uh, session lined up that I think will also be very interesting. Uh, we're hosting uh, Jim Richberg from Fortinet. And Jim is a field CISO for Fortinet. And his topic is going to be election security in the age of COVID-19, uh, risk management in the face of a perfect storm. So. I think that'll be another session that uh, there should be a lot of interest in. So again, I, I don't see any questions at this point. So I uh, think yeah, Jerry, there there is a there are a there couple one? questions. Okay, now. thank you. I didn't see them on my, um, my side. So okay, so let's see. Um, we have a question: Have you been able to test in production environments? Uh, we have, uh, so yes, um, at ARL there is a, uh, well, they're no longer a part of ARL, they're part of the C5 ISR center now, and um, they were, this one branch was maybe a couple years ago part of the Army Research Lab, but in any case, they um, are a cybersecurity service provider. And um, they're CSSP for the DOD, uh, like one of 30 monitoring Army networks or DOD networks. Um, and uh, with them, we've been able to partner to evaluate um, intrusion detection system algorithms.
Okay, Mike, do you see anything else on your uh, your side? Jerry, there is an additional question. Um, thanks, Dr. Leslie. Sorry, Joel got cut off there. Um, the question is, is the SDT3D open source? And yes. are the tools publicly accessible? Yes, SDT3D is. Python, of course, is. Um, Cybervan, however, is not. So um, recently, we've also been working with um, another network emulation tool called uh, Common Open Research Emulator, I think, Core. And Core is free. Because in the COVID situation, we haven't been able to, as a team, go into the lab and work with Cybervan. Um, and um, as a workaround, we've been using this freeware for the network emulation core. I see that um, there is a, I think there is a question from, I cannot see the last name, but Paula B. And I also see maybe there's a question from George. But I can't see the question. Yes, I, I, you, um, that last question was from Paula and you, you did answer that. Thank you. Um, I have one more here. Um, or two more, actually, one from um, Mohammed. Uh, the question is, is the adaptive detection system pre-processing IP traffic based on geolocation? And if not, can you add that to the system? Uh, is the adaptive detection system, okay, I see. Uh, this is actually um, a very, very good question because it's something that we've thought about quite a bit. As you know, the IP address has the geolocation information in it, right? Um, the first octet is generally the uh, country code, right? Um, in any case, so the IP address has that geolocation information in it. However, an adversary is spoofing. Um, their location with um, or or has in some way um, you know playing man in the middle attacks uh, or or uh, in, in any way using some uh, node in another country from where they actually are, then that can um, actually maybe cause some false positives. Um, to to uh, in the intrusion detection system and their results. So it, we we do in these um, we do look at the IP address distance um, is defined such that the geolocation information is incorporated um, as a part of the distance. If you look at that metric, uh, you can see how that that flows from that. However, there is this danger that if there is a spoofing attack, then that can um, be, that can induce false positives. Okay, I, I did see the, the question from uh, George that you mentioned earlier. He asked, will the slides be posted? And the answer is yes, the slides will be posted uh, and, and along with a recording at our website, uh, it'll take a few days for us to get those uh, get those organized. But uh, uh, but uh, the, the entire presentation has been recorded, and we will have it up on our serious website. And it looks like there is one more question from Colin Duggan. Um, do you expect that your forward-looking research can be applied to in-car networks? Oh, 
Dr. Leslie, you're still you're on mute. Oh, uh, definitely, definitely applicable to um, Canvas. We've already looked at that, and um, yes, it, it is definitely applicable. Great. Okay, Mike, is that all you see? Yeah, that's that's all I see here on my end. Great. Okay, well, again. Dr. Leslie, we really, really appreciate you taking time to spend with us this afternoon. I think your topic was uh, very well received based on the uh, high number of attendees we had today. So I think uh, I think we, we all really appreciate the time and I appreciate the time everybody spent on the call with us as well. So with that, we'll give everybody back a handful of minutes for their, for their Wednesday afternoon. And uh, hopefully we'll see everybody uh, next week uh, at 1 o'clock Eastern for our next session on Wednesday. Thank you so much. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Sure. Thank, Thank you. you.